Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to E Night Is My Night, one of my favorite days of the week, and I hope yours too. And this is another exciting night of Bible study, Bible class, and empowerment. And I hope you all in social media are near your Bibles or your devices uh, where you can get scriptures, because we're going to go through some scriptures tonight. And we're going to talk about what the Word says as we conclude a series that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, dealing with trust. Uh, I was very happy at the response that I received, and different ones were contacting me, and they were sending messages saying how helpful the series was. And interesting enough, uh, the singles, I had singles, singles contacting me saying, you know, how do I trust as a single woman? How do I trust as a single man. So we know that we dedicated a good amount of men, really the whole month of February to the married. So we want to kind of talk a little bit to the singles. And then uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to do a series that's dedicated just to the singles. I saw uh, Ariana from uh, Virginia today when she saw the post talking about singles were going to be helped. She put in the comments, she said, I can't wait. Amen. So yes, we know that there are singles out there that want to know what happens when I'm afraid to trust. You that are divorced and you're afraid to trust again. And then we're also going to talk to those in the world that have lost their trust in the church. What do we do when the world just feels they cannot trust the church, cannot trust the message that we are trying to give them what do we do about that? So those are going to be three areas we're going to talk about tonight. So we got we got quite a few scriptures, and that's what Bible class is. is you have scriptures. So you on social media, uh, please, you know it's interactive. Make sure you put your comments and your questions inside the chat and your perspectives, and we will be making sure that you are heard from uh, as well. Uh, but before we do that, I want to give a couple of announcements because I don't want to get to the end and forget. Listen, how many know that uh, we are on the road to resurrection? Amen. We are on the road to resurrection Sunday. That means Easter. You know, we as believers, we typically understand it's Easter, but we recognize that it is resurrection Sunday because this is the day where we commemorate our Savior rising from the grave, being resurrected. So GWC, we are excited because we've got four stops. That's right, we got four stops on the road to Resurrection Sunday. Stop number one is going to be this Sunday morning in our uh, weekly Sunday School 2.0. Uh, we are having uh, our special guest panelist, uh, gospel artist Tina Coleman, live from uh, Los Angeles, California, and she's going to be joining us because we're going to be talking about how Jesus trusts his father even to the cross. So we're going to be talking about that. So we always have a great time at Sunday school. So call a neighbor, call a friend, and invite them out this Sunday morning. And then on that same Sunday, stop number two on the road to resurrection, the 11 a.m. Word Works broadcast. We will be celebrating Palm Sunday. That's right. This Sunday is Palm Sunday. And I get chills in my body when I think about Palm Sunday and what Jesus is going to make his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And we've got a special message where we're going to be preaching that Sunday morning live online. Y'all ready for it? Pastor Steve is going to be preaching from king to criminal. Oh my God, you don't want to miss that one. How we're going to talk about how our Savior goes from being a king to a criminal. You got to watch the mob mentality. All right, and then stop number three on the road to resurrection. Uh, next Thursday night, there will not be E night service next Thursday night. Instead, it's going to be the next night, Friday night, which is Good Friday. As we know, Holy Weekend starts. On um, that Friday, April 7th. So we're not going to have Thursday service. We're going to push it to the next night at 7 p.m. And that's, we're going to have it. Now this, if you all, this is, listen carefully. This is going to be online only. There will be no in-person service for this service. It will be online, so you want to make sure 
Friday night, you are there, 7 o'clock. Uh, we are having the seven last words of Christ. Amen. And we call it seven cries to victory. We're going to have seven dynamic speakers that are each going to be taking one of those phrases that our Savior spoke on the cross. And I don't mind putting it out there to let you all know that one of those special, special speakers is going to be our own GWC First Lady, Lady Sandy, a.k.a. Lady G. And she is one of our speakers, and she's going to be talking about It Is Finished. So we've got some dynamic women. we got some dynamic. And listen, they're coming from all over the country. We're going to have people on from New Jersey. We're going to have people on from Georgia. We're going to have speakers all the way from California. So we're gonna, they're going to be coming all in virtual right here in Illinois. So you all don't want to miss next Friday, Seven Cries to Victory. And then finally, uh, Stop 4, which is Resurrection Sunday on uh, that Easter Sunday morning. We'll give you more information on that. But this is the GWC Road to Resurrection. All right. Keep those announcements in mind and invite somebody to join. Because if there's ever a time that we need to come together, it's Easter. Now listen, y'all criticize the folk who you call the CME Christians. Y'all know who CME Christians are? Those who want to come to church on Christmas, um, on Easter, and Mother's Day. Listen, I don't mind that. Listen, if that's the day that's going to come out, we need to celebrate and welcome them. So this is their time. So we're everybody's expecting people to come from all over. So you want to be a part of that because this is our time to let the world know that our Savior died and that there is a hope beyond the grave. Amen? Amen. So let's jump right into our, um, concluding our text tonight. We're talking about trust. T-R-U-S-T. Trust. You know, we were talking last week about faith and a couple of acronyms I want to share with you all about faith if you want to use it. We like to say faith is fantastic adventures in trusting him. Amen. Fantastic adventures in trusting him. Another faith acronym somebody says, forsaking all, I trust him. Amen. Can everybody get with that? Forsaking all, I trust him. Him. So we talked about is faith and trust the same thing, and we had a great discussion last week, and we saw the distinction between the two, but even in that acronym I just gave you, we see how they go hand in hand. Anybody looking for some fantastic adventures and trusting him? Anybody believe God can take us on an adventure? And, and in that adventure, God can show us things we never saw before if we trust him, and we have to forsake all and trust him. So I've got first lady, she's gonna, we got our members that are gonna help us read some scriptures tonight. So I'm gonna first start open up and I want to address uh the singles tonight, amen. The single men and the single women. Uh doesn't matter what age you are, and, and some of you all have been single, you know, for a long time. Uh some of you all have been recently single. Some of you all were in a relationship, but something happened. And now you are single. This is man, male or female. And we have what they say, sometimes you get burnt. Everybody know what that means? That sometimes you just feel like you got burned and you just don't want to give your heart out again. You just don't trust that person. You don't want to let your guard down. You, you did it before. They hurt you. You, you, you. you opened up again to them. They hurt you again. And now you are at a point now where you have your the walls built up. You got your defense mechanisms up, and you don't want to trust nobody in a relationship again. And sometimes that non-trust in a relationship trickles to other areas of your life, even your spiritual life. Amen. When you, as a natural, don't feel like you can trust anybody, oftentimes you begin to not feel like you can even trust God. So we want to talk about that tonight because not only do we want you singles, uh, you divorced out there. Many times people forget about the divorced people. And yeah, if you divorce, I want you to let, you know, you can tell us how you feel. But we know that divorced people sometimes feel like they can't trust again because they've invested so much of their life, invested so much of themselves in a marriage and then it didn't work out for whatever reason. And now they're out there and they're single again. They find themselves in a place that they may not have been for 10, 20 years. Amen? 
Amen. And it's a strange world. How I many you know it's a strange world out there right now? And you're, if you're single in this world, listen, you need to be listening tonight because you need the love of Jesus and the direction of the Holy Ghost to help you in this day and time. It's a hard life being a single right now. And it's very hard for those who are entering back into this lifestyle. Amen. So because of that, you feel like you can't trust anymore. You feel like you can't even trust yourself. How many sometimes, how many of you are in a situation where sometimes we feel like we can't even trust ourselves? I know sometimes I feel that way because I know I might do the wrong thing. I might make the wrong decision. I'm, sometimes on certain things I'm kind of afraid because I'm like, ah, I, you know how I feel. And you're like, I, I saw what happened before the last time I did this. It got hurt. The last time I stepped out on faith, I got hurt. So then I want to go to a scripture first to encourage you. If some, if we all can give me Jeremiah uh, 29 and 11. Jeremiah 29 and 11. It's a familiar passage of scripture. If you have it on social media, uh, get it on your phones. But I want to encourage the uh, single men and the single woman that God has not forgotten you and he sees you in your singleness. When you have it, read it. Amen. We're talking about Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, the 11th verse. And if you're looking for Jeremiah in the back of the Bible, you're not going to find him. you got to look for Jeremiah right there in the middle. All right, we have it? Yes, reading it from the NIV version. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Mm, all right. So, and then I have a version that says in the King James, for this is God talking, this is through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, let the people know that in the midst of their situation and in the midst of their singleness, in the midst of you feeling lonely, in the midst of you feeling like nobody wants you, nobody wants to date you, you can't find the right person, you can't find a, uh, with the right person, qualities that you're looking for. You've been out here a long time and now or you've been hurt and you don't trust. God wants to let you know that while you are in your singleness, you can trust him because he says, I know, I know the plans. Listen to this. And I think her says, God, I know the thoughts. God is thinking about you, single man. God is thinking about you, single woman, and he knows the thoughts and plans he has for you. He said, these are thoughts that are good and not evil to break you to an expected end. Well, Pastor Steve, I've been single a while. How long do I have to stay single? I'm tired of being by myself. It looks like God is giving everybody else a mate. God is giving everybody else some companionship, but I'm still by myself. What do I do? Do I just give up? And oh my God, don't let the devil, don't let the devil tell you that because you're not getting the person that you want, that you may go and get a different type of person. Y'all know what I mean by that. Don't, don't go to another way thinking that that's the way to get your companionship. God says, I see you. And if you can trust me in your singleness, I have some plans for you. God is building that person. God is fine. He has that person, that man, that woman, just for you. And he's going to bring them at the appointed time. Single people, be encouraged by that. He's going to bring them at the appointed time. And now I want to give you something to do while you're waiting. Amen. How many are waiting is hard? None of us like to wait, right? Well, Pastor Steve, I hear what you're saying. Trust God. But how long should I trust him? You know, I, I, I know some people that didn't get married until they were, you know, 50, you know, almost 50 years old or better, and they waited on God. And they trusted that God was going to send them a mate no matter how long it took. And they finally got that mate, and they're happy. So don't get caught up in how long it's been. Don't get caught up in the age. God does not care about time. He's preparing that person. So what do you do? How you waiting? Anybody in class want to ask anybody on social media? What should you be doing while you're waiting? What, should, what would you all inside the house advise singles to be doing while they're waiting? 
Should that be waiting and worrying? No. Study his word. Leaning into what his word has for us to do. All right. One well, said leaning into his word uh, for what he has for us to do. But what else? What else should they be doing? Should they be waiting and complaining? So, okay, all right, so now they're waiting, and the Bible says, wait on the Lord. What? And again, I say wait, right? You know, uh, but now I'm waiting, but it's taking a long time. And every day I wake up thinking about I'm being single. I wake up thinking about I'm still by myself. My mind is not allowing me to be at peace. And one scripture tells us in Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, and I'll read it for you right quick. It says, you keep in you keep him in perfect peace whose mind stayed on you because he trusts you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. This is Isaiah saying, when you keep your mind on the Lord, he will keep you in perfect peace. Why? Because you are trusting. There's that word trust we're talking about. The perfect peace comes when you trust. Confusion comes when you don't trust. Am I right? None of us feel at ease when we're in a tough situation, do we? None of us feel at ease when we don't know the outcome. We're uncertain about how it's going to come out. So that we don't have peace, we can't sleep, we can't eat, we can't work, we can't think. Because we're thinking about that situation. And those of you that are single, you have needs. You've got physical needs. You've got emotional needs. And these are things that are waking up with you, <laughs> and they're going to be in with you at night. So now Isaiah says, what you do while you're waiting is, you are to keep your mind stayed on God. And one person said in the room, the way you keep your mind stayed on God is staying in his word. Help them out tonight, y'all. What's another way a person can keep their mind on God? Come on, social media, what, talk to us tonight. What's another way we, you, I can keep our mind stayed on God? Yes, we can stay in his word. What else can we do? We can pray, that's right. We can stay in prayer. Amen. Prayer is the key. If prayer has a way of taking you out of yourself and put you into another realm so that God can talk to you. Amen. I was dealing with something really tough myself. And this morning, about 3 in the morning, I was on my knees in prayer. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't think. It was bothering me. I kept trying to get past it. I kept trying to, to, to not let it get to me. And I found out that I couldn't do it by myself. Merely just laying there wasn't going to do it. But I had to get up. And I had to go into the, my office, my prayer closet, and I had to get down on my knees and have a little talk with my God. I said, Father, I need you right now. I, I, I need you to help me trust you so that I can have peace in the midst of this situation. And I begin, at, and, 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 and as I was praying, I began to just quote scriptures. This is something you ought to do, single people, divorced people. Begin to pray scriptures. Anybody know about praying scriptures? You say, I don't know what to pray when I get down, Pastor Steve. I can't pray that long. I don't know what to say. Just get down there and begin to just pro quote some scriptures. Quote your favorite scripture. That scripture that resonates with you. Listen, after a while, you begin to start quoting them and you'll feel better. Y'all know what I start doing? I start I start. Quote Romans 8 28. I said, For we know this, that all things work together for those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. I begin to do Psalms 91 to say, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say unto the Lord that He is my fortune, He is my reference, He is my God, in Him will I trust. I begin to say, My God shall provide all of my needs according to his power that work the importance of his power. I begin to say that uh, he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all I can think or ask according to the power 
their work up in us. See, listen, and after a while, I, 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 I kept quoting them, and I kept quoting them. I began to quote more, and then the more I quoted y'all, the Holy Spirit stepped in, and he began to give me what to say. See, single, that's what y'all got to do. You got to get to a point that you pray long enough that the Holy Spirit will get in your prayer with you, and he will take over the prayer. Now, if y'all ever prayed long enough when the Holy Spirit took over your prayer, See, when the Holy Spirit takes over your prayer, you stop thinking about what you got to do at work. You stop thinking about what you got to do when you get done. You stop thinking about what you got to cook, all that. And, and, and your mind gets into a spiritual realm. And that's when he begins to minister to your trust. Amen? See, single people, divorced people, that's when God begins to minister to that hurt. He begins to give you that peace that Isaiah said, I'll give you perfect peace. If you keep your mind stayed on me. Amen. So this another thing that they should be doing. Somebody give me uh, first Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and the 31st, 34th verse. In social media, y'all get that? Let's go over to First Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and the 34th verse. And I want y'all to understand that it's going to apply to both men and women, although you're going to hear it saying woman. But it works for men too. When y'all get it, say amen. So while they're getting that, 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, in the New Testament, uh, the seventh chapter, the 34th verse. This is something that's going to tell you what to do while you are waiting. See, the Bible tells us in Revelations that while we're waiting for Christ to come back, we are to occupy until he comes. That means we're not to be sitting around idle. With, all right, we have it. Go ahead. You said 1 Corinthians 7 and... 34. 1 Corinthians 7 and 34. Mm -hmm. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman period for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, by, both in body and spirit, but she that is married cared for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Yes, people. I discuss that. Any y'all, any y'all want to talk about that? Anyone y'all in the room? Anything y'all want to come say about that scripture? What does that mean to you all when you hear that? Anybody want to take a stab at that? That there's a priority for um, a single woman and there's a priority for a married woman. All right. So there's a priority for a single woman. So we're talking about the single women tonight, as well as the single men. Amen. Amen. And we, and we got a scripture for the single men, too. But she said that there's a priority for the single woman. And what is that priority? Well, for the single woman who's not married, um, her, her priority should be on the things of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That is anything that pertains to the Lord. That's her priority. All right. So she, why are you a single woman? Why are you a single woman? And we're talking about the man, but why are you a single woman? This is how you build your trust in God. Even if you were in a relationship and it ended badly, and it may not even have been a relationship where it was an intimate relationship, it could have been a relationship with a family member. It could have been a relationship with a sibling. Sometimes we have families that are strange because they've had arguments, they've had disagreements, and they haven't talked in years. And you don't trust to even be with them because you're afraid they're going to hurt you again when they come in your presence. But those that are single and you're waiting for God to send you your mate, instead of complaining, you should be doing the things that pertain to the Lord. So what are those things that pertain to the Lord? Reading our Bible, fasting, praying, being busy in the church, doing kingdom work. Sometimes... There's an old saying that says an idle mind is the devil's workshop. See, you can't keep yourself in perfect peace if you're not keeping your mind stayed on things that's productive. As long as you're sitting around complaining about how you ain't got nobody, don't nobody want you and all this, you're not going to be in peace and you're not going to be productive. God says there's going to come a time that you're not going to be able to always make this a priority. Because she just said it. She said there's a priority for the single and then there's a priority for the married. So when you marry, once you get married, you start to have more things that vibe for your attention, don't you? 
Because now you would say the married, um, the married woman uh, does the things that pertains to her husband, how she should please her husband. So now while you are single, you have all of this time to shore up your relationship with God. You've got all of this time to get strong in God. You've got all of this time to make God your boyfriend, to make God your, your companionship, to make God the lover of your soul. So that when you do get married, you'll have so much strength and you'll be so close to God that when the trials of marriage come, and they will come, you will be able to stand it. Because you spent that time being single, not complaining and murmuring and going from club to club trying to figure out who will like you. But you said, no, I'm going to wait on God. And I'm going to let God, I'm going to spend my time because he knows how I feel right now. And that's why Jeremiah, we said it, he knows the plans he has for you. Well, he wants to know what are you going to do while you're waiting. Amen. And, and, and for the men, the Bible said this for the single men. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing, amen, and obtains favor with the Lord. So he finds his wife, but he needs to be careful where he's looking. You need men, you need to be looking for your wife where God will happen. Say, well, what you going to say, Pastor, I'm going to look for him in church? It's a lot of people in church ain't good either. That's true. But you need to be asking God where to search for your man. You two men need to be asking God why you single. Lord, keep me. You know, you know. a lot of times they say men have, have a little harder time uh, being kept physically than women do. Amen. I don't know if that's so much true nowadays or not. But the, God is able to keep you. And what we used to say first lady, they told us growing up, they said the Holy Ghost will keep you if you want to be kept. Amen. Amen. They taught us that the Holy Ghost was a keeper. And while you are single, he will keep you. Why are you single? If you trust in him. And that's how your trust comes back. And you say, well, even if you got burned before, the Holy Ghost can help you not get burned again. Because he will show you what you didn't see the last time. And that's what you should be doing. So single people, we wanted to give that part of this trust to him. Begin to trust God. Stop trusting yourself. Stop trusting your instincts. Stop trusting your gut. Stop trusting your girlfriends and, your, and, 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 and the brothers that you're hanging out with and start to trust God. Now, I want to do, I want you all to go over, I told you we got scriptures tonight, but this is Bible class. I want you all to go over to Matthew, the 14th chapter, uh, the 22nd through the 31st verse. So Matthew 14, 22, and 31. So now we're going to deal with stepping out of faith. We're going to deal with taking a chance and trusting. And this is going to be for people that we talk about who no longer trust the church. Church, we have done, we have some work to do in getting people to trust the church again. And, and I, I'm sure you saw there's a lot of different videos out there, a lot of different uh, examples out there that people are going around that gives a good reason why people don't trust the church anymore. But that is not to be an excuse for you not to trust God. I understand you don't trust the church, but we're trying to teach you not to trust the church, not just trust the pastor, but we're trying to teach you to trust God. So I want you all, do you have that uh, for me? Matthew 14, 22 and 31. Yep, 20, yeah, 22 down 31. 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Mm -hmm. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was still alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Mm -hmm. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down 
out of the ship, he walked out on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. What happened? And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? All right. So we want to talk about this because this is a good example right here of what happens when you see Jesus in front of you. You see the church and it's beckoning to you. And now it's time to take a step against fear to come to Jesus. The church has made you feel the disciples were in the boat. They were, these were there. The disciples are representative of the church. This was Jesus' posse. This was his homies. They were in the boat, and he went off to pray. Y'all see, I said, and Jesus was alone, and he went off to pray. We got to catch that, y'all. Now, Jesus has to pray. Why do we think we don't have to pray? He found time to get up and go pray. He left them, and then he came back. And they were all on the ship, out there on the boat. They was in the church. And everybody in the church talking about what's going on, talking about what's going on. And then they look outside, and there's Jesus. Now, isn't it strange that the very one that they had seen feed the 5,000, men and women, then 4,000 another time, the very same one they seen healed the blind and man. The same one that they saw uh, heal Jairus' daughter. Amen. Rose Lazarus from the grave. They saw him turn water into wine at the wind at Cana. This is the church observing all of these things they did. But now that same Jesus comes walking towards them on the water. So now, instinctively, they stop looking at who's coming to them and start looking at how he's coming to them. See, that's why right now people don't trust the church anymore. They don't trust ministry anymore because they stop looking at who's coming to them and then they start looking at how it's coming to them. Yeah. What do you mean by that, Pastor Steve? How, uh, you know, if we're not preaching the right way, if we don't have all the gimmicks, and if we don't have all the, all the bells and whistles, if we're not catered to a maker like this, a club for you to show up at. Or if it's a rock concert with all the flashing lights and all of that. If we don't make it look like what we want, we don't trust that it's church. Yeah, it's true. And we says they don't trust that it's church. They say, well, it looks the same way there than it does when I go other places. So, so many things have happened in the church that cause people not to trust how we bring Jesus. That we stop looking at the fact of that Jesus is who we should be focused on. So right in here, the church is behind him, and Peter, big mouth Peter, y'all know Peter, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't look, if you don't ever read about somebody, you read about Peter. Peter is indicative of a lot of us. Peter was big mouth. Peter spoke out of turn. Peter was impulsive. Peter was kind of crass. Look, I said it this way. Peter knew how to keep it real. You know, at all the people in the boat, Peter was the one that always, Jesus was always said, all right, you know, hold on a second here. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me help you out here, Peter. But Jesus liked that because Peter was never afraid to say how he felt. And so now when they looked out there and he saw Jesus, they said, wait a minute, this is a spirit. Because you know what, have they ever seen anybody walk on water before? Now, understand, let's not beat up the church too bad. Now, let's not beat them up too much, because if, if somebody can't walk on the water to you today, you'd be kind of like, okay, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, I ain't having a drink, so I don't know why I'm just uh, seeing my imagination playing tricks on me. But he came walking on the water as an example to show them that I want you not to focus on how I'm coming to you, but focus on the fact that I'm coming to you. So Peter doing what the other people in church are afraid to do. Peter says, all right, God, Jesus, if that's you, then be me to come out there too. So we're talking to people right now that you don't trust the church anymore. You lost your trust in the ministry. You've seen 
preachers and pastors and churches and evangelists and missionaries and, and just Christians, believers at large, being every kind of way they shouldn't be uh, as opposed to what they professing themselves to be. So you're like, no, oh, I can't get with that. There's too many hypocrites. I don't trust the church no more. I used to, but I don't. What Jesus said, now listen, I tell you what, give it another try. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe that I'm still real, that ministry and church is still real, come. Did y'all notice that anybody, did anybody else in the church come to Peter? Now, how come nobody else got off the boat? All the church people there, but only one member of the church said, all right, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, all right, come on out here with your bad stuff. <laughs> he came on out there, and Peter, now come on now, this is the, now y'all was on, let me put it to you this way. If y'all was out there on Lake Michigan, in the middle of it, and, 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 and you on a boat, and somebody said, come on, just jump into the water, you ain't going to jump in the water without a life preserver. You ain't going you ain't gonna jump in the water, you ain't got no tug, no sailboat, no kind of protection. You just gonna jump in the water. Well, this is what Jesus was asking Peter to do. Because he said, if you're going to trust me, I'm gonna put you in situations where you're gonna really have to understand what trust in me looks like. Can you put your fear aside? And I heard this the other day, which I hope I don't mess it up. Somebody said the acronym of fear was. False evidence appearing real. Now, ain't that? Fear is false evidence appearing real. That's why you can't trust, because you've been presented with false evidence that appears to be real, but in inwardly is really not real. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Come on, Bible scholars. What's the other part? The evidence. The evidence of things hoped for. Not the false evidence, but the evidence means this is the evidence, Your Honor, that this is true, what we say. So now, God, Jesus says, put your fear aside and come and trust me. Peter gets down off the boat. All the deacons looking at him. All the preachers looking at him in the pool. Come on, look at him. Peter, there you go again. Peter's so impulsive. Peter be doing the most all the time, don't he? He's so extra. And Peter got off the boat. Stepped onto the water, and he began to walk. So in the midst of his situation, he began to walk. Now, as long as the Bible says Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, what did it say happened when Peter, what happened to the water over the waves, first lady? The wind was boisterous. The wind was boisterous. The noise, the circumstances of life, the trials and tribulations of life started going around him. Reminding him of what you you can you, well, hear all the reasons you couldn't trust are coming back. They swirling around you, and all of a sudden he starts to do what? He starts to pay attention to all of those voices on him, all those in his ear saying, "This is what happened when you trusted the last time. This is what's going to happen if you trust this time." Uh huh. You gave your heart to that person. Uh huh. You came to that church and they hurt you. They burnt you, and all of that starts swirling around. And as long as Peter kept walking. Toward, the Bible said he was walking on water, but when he stopped and started to pay attention to the noise, the Bible said, what happened? He was afraid and began to sink. He was afraid and began to sink because the evidence in front of him was false. The evidence said you can't walk on water. The fear set in. You can't trust. What do you think you're doing? You're going to get hurt. They're going to hurt. They're going to mess you up again. And that was false evidence appearing real. And the Bible said he started to sink. Which means when we stop trusting God and we stop looking at who was coming, and, they, and, 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 and when we stop looking at how he was coming versus who was coming, then that's when we actually start sinking. And we start going down. Because our lack of trust takes us down, don't it? What was that Isaiah we said earlier about, I will keep you in perfect peace, all whose minds stayed on me. See, your trust builds in God 
and you get perfect peace because you realize you can trust him when you can't trust nobody else. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. And so he began to say, and what I like about Jesus is Jesus didn't do what the church did. Y'all know how we do when somebody we get in the sink and they start down and they start backing away. We talk about it, don't we? We start judging. We start criticizing. You should know better. How long have you been saved? You've been in church how many years? And what's your position? Well, I, you, you, you talk so good about that. Now it's come up. We start to beat them up. But Jesus didn't do that. Peter had the sense enough to look at who he was walking to. And he said, the only somebody I can trust in this situation. Because listen now, while he was on the water, who else could he trust? He couldn't trust himself, right? He couldn't trust the water. He couldn't trust the wind and the waves. And he turned around and he couldn't trust the church. I don't think any disciples were back there saying, you go, Peter. Walk out there, Peter. That's faith right there. There you go, boy. That's right, Peter. Which is what the church should be doing when a member steps out. Backing them up. Because that's what the angels are doing. The angels start, when you listen, when you start to trust God, the angels start rooting for you. They start becoming your cheerleaders. They, oh, wait a minute now. He, she trusts him. Look at him. Look at him trusting God. Go ahead. That's what we're talking about. And they in there rooting for you. As you coming back, they run with you. They run in faith with you. Because that's what the church should be doing. But Jesus said, come. And Peter has a sense enough to say, Lord, Save me. You know why he said that? Because he acknowledged and he took his pride aside. And this is what you all have to do, especially those of you who feel like you know you don't trust the church no more. You, you can't you say that you can't trust nobody no more. You have to put all of that aside and say, Lord, save me. God gets on the side of those who are honest. Amen. See, the problem with most believers is we try to act like we're more than what we are. You are, look, you more capacity, you don't have as much spiritual capacity as you walk around telling everybody. Because the Bible says this, if you faint, come on somebody, in the day of adversity, your faith is small. That's what the Bible said. I didn't say that. So now if you, if you so got so much faith and you got so much trust and so much power and anointing, then the day of adversity is going to come. And it is in that day, what, what our guy used to say, Sandy, your faith will do what? Locate you. Your faith will locate you. That means it will tell you exactly what level of spirituality you have. And most times, can't nobody, else, can't nobody around but you in that situation in God. And that's when the rubber meets the road right there. But Peter acknowledged that in that moment, I don't have the faith, God. I don't trust the situation right now. But one thing I'm learning, if you save me, I'll be okay. And when he said those words, like this wasn't the save me as an accept Christ as your savior. This was, Peter was saying, rescue me, help me, Lord. Throw me a life preserver. And Jesus took his hand and pulled him back up. And Peter, because he trusted in that situation, I want to know if the theologians in the house can help me out right now. You on social media. Is there any other scenario in the Bible we can think of with somebody other than Jesus and Peter walked on the water? Was there any other disciple that ever did what Peter did? Peter goes down in history as the only human being to ever walk on water and go after Jesus. Because he decided to trust God. He decided to trust. He decided to trust and realize that his help was in front of him. He went down in history as being the only somebody. We all talk about Mary, don't we? We talk about how Mary was highly favored and she was the only one that has the testimony she had. And that's true. That's why she's so famous too. But I want to let you know why Peter's so famous. He's so famous because he trusted. He's so famous because he put his fear aside. He's so famous that he forgot about what the church was saying. He forgot about what the wind and his past was saying. He forgot about his past hurts. He forgot about getting burnt before. He forgot about all of that and said, God, I'm going to trust you for saving all I trust him. And he had a fantastic adventure 
in trusting him, didn't he? And that's what this lesson is teaching. We're talking about getting the trust back. Getting, getting your trust back in God. I have this here all the time. Trust in the Lord. Amen. I want, uh, let me see. I got another scripture. We only got a couple minutes, but I got another scripture that I want to use. And I want you all to go to Daniel. Uh oh. We're going to the book of Daniel. Oh my goodness. Daniel's in the Old Testament. Daddy boy's in the Old Testament. Daniel, the third chapter. And I want you all to go down to, because it's a lot, I want to read all of that. All right? You go down. All right, so I want you all to go down to Daniel, the, fourth, the third chapter, and watch the side of the 13th verse, and I'll tell you when to stop. Come on, so now, this is what's going to happen now. I'm about, about to flip the script on y'all. Social media, y'all ready for this? I'm about to flip the script on y'all because you said, Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve, if I trust God, everything going to be okay. If I trust God, perhaps I won't have to go through that situation. If I trust God, I perhaps I'll be shielded from getting hurt. If I trust God, I'll be protected from having to go through that trial and tribulation. Uh-uh. Here comes trust, y'all, when y'all have a reading. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Mm -hmm. Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of a, the cornet, Flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Mm -hmm. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast into the in the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Uh -huh. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it, 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 it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of the hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy God, mm. nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Yes. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was, won't be healed, heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and ten cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their garments, and were cast in the midst of the burning fiery I'm furnace. I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited. Therefore, because the, the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three? Uh -huh. and to the uh -huh. of the fire. Uh -huh. They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Uh -huh. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning, burning fiery furnace, and spake, and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, 
and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their hair, the hair on their head, sin. Stop. Did y'all hear that? I, I, I wanted to let the word talk right there a little bit. See, this is what happens. See, because sometimes we have to understand that, yes, trust in God, we trust him to take us through a situation, or sometimes we trust him that he'll keep us from having to go through the situation. But what happens when we have to trust him and we still have to go through it? That's when it gets a little hard. Now, see, most Christians, we're trusting God to keep us from the situation because we don't want to have to deal with it, period. But see, God's power does not get shown when he keeps us away from the problems. Because he said, your ex man's extremity is God's opportunity. See, a lot of us want the testimony without the test. A lot of us want to win the battle. We want the victory without the battle. How do you win a battle? How do you get the victory you don't fight a battle? You know, we, we want God to just do it, and we don't want to be bothered with it. But in this scenario here, it said, listen, you guys, they decided they was not going to give in to what the world was doing. And that's what we want to go before we close this out. You that are, right now, you got to learn that we have to trust God. Don't give in to what the world is doing right now. I don't care what all this new stuff is. They try to say, do this. We got all of these celebrities. We got all of these political people that are telling us to do all of this stuff against what we know to be true. But these three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and a big old Negro, they stood in there and they said, I am not going to fall down and bow and worship your God. I'm not going to give into all of this secular stuff. I'm not going to give into all of this worldly stuff because I have a God that I have to serve. And he said, now, if you don't do it, I'm going to throw you in the fire. At that point, we would have said, God, keep us on the fire. Keep us on the fire, God. Deliver us. I trust you to keep me from the fire. And God said, no, I'm not to keep me from the fire because it's going to make more of an impact when I put you in the fire. And now he put them in the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar was so upset, he said, turn the furnace up seven times hotter than it was. If the, look, God will turn the heat up seven times hotter. On purpose, he'll tell the devil, turn it up. The devil, like, a little bit, that's enough, he said, more. The devil, like, that's enough, he said, more. Because God said, the more you turn it up, the more I'm going to be glorified. And he turned the fire up so high that the million that was putting them in. Y'all y'all know how it is when you're cooking or, or you're baking. You put something in the oven or you're on a grill it's so hot. Sometimes you almost burn your hand put the stuff in the oven, don't you? But he said, now the men that put them in there, they burned up trying to put them in there. That's how hot it was. Now these are three men walking around inside a fiery furnace. That's like being inside a grill. Hot coals, and they trust in God. Now, at that door, I can imagine they would have been feeling like we was feeling like God. If, uh, you know, if there's another way we can do this, you know, right now would be a good time to tell us, uh, oh, okay, God, I know you're not going to let us get in the furnace. You're just, you're just trying to prove a point. You're going to let us get right to the door, and then you're going to yank us back. Okay, God, we wait for you to yank us back. God didn't yank them back. He let them go in there, turn the fire up. And guess who appeared in the fire with them? See, this is the part y'all got to get. I know y'all ready to go, but this is the part y'all got to get. Why trusting God is such a good thing. Because in the midst of the furnace, old Nebuchadnezzar himself, and I wonder how did old Nebuchadnezzar know this? He asked the question. He said, wait a minute. He said, did not we throw three in there? They said, yeah, can't we throw three? He said, no, check the, check the map. I'm looking in there and I see a fourth person. And he said, and the fourth one looked like the son of God. I always wonder, how did old Nebuchadnezzar know that that was the son of God? This is in the Old Testament. that Jesus hadn't been revealed visually to anybody. But how did old Nebuchadnezzar know? And this lets you all know, Jesus was there in the beginning. See, he revealed himself at the time he needed to be revealed. 
See, God will reveal himself to your enemy at the time it needs to be revealed. And it brought about Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. And then he said, listen, come on. He said, they got out there and they said, okay, we good. We good up in here. And when they came out, everybody saw them come out. They weren't burned up. They weren't tattered. They weren't charred. They were singed as I said. They, was, they came out better than they was when they went in. Why? Because it said here, because Nebuchadnezzar testified for them. When you start to trust God, you ain't going to have to testify that you trust God. People will testify for you. Nebuchadnezzar said, these boys came out okay because they trusted in their God. My God, what an adventure that had to be. This big old king said they trusted in their God. And because of that, he told everybody to trust in their God. See, that, that's, that's what we got to get, y'all. That sometimes we go through this stuff because God said, I need you to be a testimony. I need you to be a vessel so I can save others. So they can see that this impossible situation that you couldn't trust them in and you dare to trust God anyway. Not all of the people in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, he decreed that they serve their God. That's what trusting in God is all about. And listen, he, did y'all notice this? And we done. And they came out better than they looked when they went in. They weren't burned by, they walked around in the heat. So listen, right now, you in the heat, right? Single people, you in the heat. You in the fiery furnace right now. Those that feel like the church has been burnt you, and they, and they gave up on you, they messed you up, men and women, you in the furnace right now. Now, while you in the furnace, Jesus is in there with you. And if you can be like Peter and just reach your hand out and say, Lord, save me. Jesus was there with Peter on the water, and he showed up to the three Hebrew boys in the furnace. Ain't it, glad, ain't it good to know that when we can show up trouble, Jesus will show up. All we have to do is trust him. And that's our message for tonight. And we thank you all for participating with us these last few weeks. All we try to do is to raise all of our level of trust. Trust in God. And we say here, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If y'all don't ever know any other scripture about trust, you can have this. This is in my office. And again, I always say this. The first thing people see when they come in my office, they see this. And guess what? I have to see it too. And not only see it, but I got to believe it. And I got to experience it. Look, I have my own furnace to be in right now. But I got to be like the, 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 the three Hebrew boys. The most important thing they said, they said, now, King, listen, let's, let's make it plain, make it clear now. Don't get it twisted. If he don't deliver us, he's still able. See, that's the testimony right there. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him to do it the way he want to do it. So if he don't even deliver me, I know that's the best way because he knows what he's doing all the time. If he wanted to deliver me, King, he could do it. So don't sit up there and say, oh, I thought your God would. No, if my God want to do it, he can do it. That's what faith and trust in God is all about. Can you all, Can we trust God like that? Yes. Can we begin to ask God? And listen, sometimes it's going to get rough, and we all are going to have to reach our hand out like Peter and say, Lord, save me. None of us are supermen and superwomen. That situation that hits you is hard. That situation that will come on you, it will knock you down. And you will feel yourself sinking like Peter. But if you could just raise your hand today and say, Lord, save me. Jesus said, I'm here to save you. And he'll take you by the hand and he'll pull you out of that situation. And you will have a testimony like Peter that when the situation would have took me down, God pulled me up. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, can we get a little of hand for that tonight? Can we give God a hand and give him trust for you, God? Come on, I think we just got to give him a praise because our God can be trusted. We ought to give him a praise because our God is the one. He's our anchor. He's the one. He's a solid rock. Listen, one of the things I love about he told Peter, he said, Peter, he said, I pray for you that your faith fail you not. And we're going to see this over the next, over this holy week because Jesus is going to show us the ultimate example of trusting God and still having to go through the situation because the glory don't come until the other side of what he had to go through. But he trusted God and he said, Peter, I pray for you 
Because the devil desires to sift you as weak. Listen, you all, I feel the spirit having me tell you this right now. Some of you all right now that listen, the devil desires to sift you as weak. Young man, young woman, young girl, young boy, single man, single woman. God, the, the one that left the church. The devil desires to sift you as weak. But right now, we're praying for you that your faith fail you not. And if you all that are in your situation right now, we're praying that your faith fail you not. And he told Peter, he said, and after you have been strengthened, he said, go. After you've been converted, go and strengthen your brother. Amen. We thank you. Listen, we're looking forward to seeing you all on Sunday morning. Amen. Remember, Palm Sunday is this Sunday. Tune in 9 o'clock for the Sunday School 2.0. And then be there at 11 o'clock if you can. We're going to be preaching from King to criminal as we continue on our next stop on the road to resurrection. Amen. And again, next Friday night is Good Friday. No E-night service next Thursday, but instead it's going to be next Friday, online only, so you don't have to come out to the building. Online only, and we're going to have seven great speakers that are going to be talking about the seven last words of Christ. Y'all don't want to miss that next stop on the road to resurrection. God, have, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for your people, God. Lord, we thank you, God, that you don't that you have patience with us, that you have understanding with us, that even when we don't trust like we should, God, that you have mercy on us. And God, tonight we're all asking you to help us to trust you, God. When we don't help us to not have doubt, help us that when we have those moments where we just don't feel like it's going to work out. Those moments where we just feel like it's, it's too hard. I don't, I don't want to get hurt again. I, I, I don't want to take my guard down. Give us to know, God, that we're not taking our guard down to the world, but we're taking our guard down to you. And you've got plans for us, plans that are good and not evil, to bring us to an expected end. We ask that you forgive us now, God, if we not trusted you, if we doubted you. God, if we were double-minded in all our ways, Lord, forgive us, O oh God, and renew our strength and trust in you. For the glory of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thank God. Amen. Listen, before you go, we ask that you can give an offering tonight. Social media, cash app is at GWG Ministry 67, or sell us at 708-925-7954, or you can use the Giveify app. Uh, so a seed tonight of $10 or whatever you're able to give to help us continue in this work. Can you trust God for $10? Oh, my goodness. Can you trust him for a little $10? And he will take that. He don't need it. He's just going to take it and multiply it and give it right back to you. But sometimes the trust God has teaches us trust in little small steps. Amen. In little small ways. And the more you do those, then he starts to feed you bigger things. And that's how your trust in him grows. Amen. So we thank you for that. And we see you on Sunday morning. God bless you, everybody.